Welcome back. Oh, I feel like I'm especially loud. Maybe we can take it down just a little bit. Thank you. I hope everybody got a little bit of extra rest this morning. I know I did. Um, this is always a, a welcome treat, um, though when it gets dark at 4.30, it's not quite so welcome. It's welcome for about 12 hours, maybe. <laughs> um, this is my last week uh, up here instructing you. Next week, it'll be Pastor Nick, so uh, I know everyone is looking forward to that, but you don't have to wait. He's preaching, <laughs> not, he's preaching this morning, and he's um, published in our bulletin. It counts if it's just our bulletin, right? He's published in our bulletin um, an article on uh, the Apocrypha, why don't Protestants accept the Apocrypha as part of the Old Testament canon? And this is something that we uh, kind of rushed by um, in our examination of the scriptures, but it's a good topic, it's an important topic. Kids, this is one of those things that I mentioned some people may ask you about. So um, he's got a, a simple explanation here for you and it would be good to take a look at that if you have questions. Um, please, again, don't forget, this is another reminder uh, about our Inquirer's class barbecue. We want to make sure that we have lots and lots of food for you. So if you have not yet signed up, please do that. We'd really appreciate it. <clears throat> okay, so this morning, um, as usual, we'll start out with a review, but um, I, I just want to mention this uh, particular lesson goes in a lot of different directions, and it may be kind of hard to... Uh, figure out what the thread is throughout. This is part five, who is the Holy Spirit, the essence of conversion. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. We're going to talk about conversion. We're going to talk about regeneration. Um, I think more, a little bit more of the main point of this session is, um, you know, the, the personal application of this salvation story. We've talked about uh, the God's plan for salvation in universal terms, broad terms, Today we're going to talk about what that looks like a little bit more specifically to uh, individuals. So if, uh, if, if that helps you kind of see the through thread this morning, um, uh, I hope it does. So uh, our review, uh, and, and uh, to review at this point could take a lot of time, so what I'd like to do is ask a few more questions this morning. <laughs> I've got your names all on a list, so I'm going to go through and I'm going to start with Jude because <laughs> he's, he's ready. I prepped him last night, um, Jude, but I told him we were talking about the Holy Spirit today, so maybe he won't be able to answer this question. You have notes, a binder full of notes though, so Jude... We said that the Bible is two things. Where is he? He's really hiding. <laughs> we said that the Bible is two things. It's lots of things, but we said it's two things that start with eyes. Do you remember what those are? <laughs> All right, somebody help him out. Two things that start with eyes. Oh, we did talk about it being inspired. Very good. I was looking for two other things, the things that we... Um, generally, uh, don't remember the, the definitions to Esther. Inerrant and infallible. Very good. Inerrant and infallible. And the definitions for those were that inerrant is the, sort of the easier one, that it doesn't contain any errors, and then infallible means that it's actually incapable of containing any errors. Very good. So this is, the, this is the inspired word of God. It's God-breathed. We're going to talk about that a little bit more today. Um, and it's something that we trust. This is God's revealed word to us. And we look to it for our answers uh, to the questions that we have and to understand God's plan of salvation for us. And I've encouraged you many times, if some of the things that we've discussed in this class don't make sense to you, the best way to make sense of them in your own brain is to read all of scripture. I think so many Christians really struggle with some of these concepts because uh, a lot of us are coming from churches where the whole Bible isn't preached. Uh, the whole Bible isn't referenced. We might get lots of really great sermon series, topical messages, that kind of thing. Those, are, those can be really valuable, but we need to understand the whole story from beginning to end to make sense of some of these things. Um, and then we talked about the attributes of God. Um, the attributes of God. Uh, anybody, can anybody sing the, uh, the attributes of God for me? I'm not going to call on anybody specifically. God is a spirit infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. What? I know all those messy 
<laughs> in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. So we talked through all of those things. Um, we talked about God being revealed truly to us, not fully. Uh, we, if God revealed himself fully to us, we would not be we, we would cease to exist. This is not something that we can hold in our brain. But the Catechism gives us uh, some specifics. We talked about him being a triune God, that there are three persons in the Godhead and that they are equal in substance and power and glory. Last week we talked a little bit about what substance means Remember the chairness analogy that I gave to you? If we all imagine a different chair in our head, they're all going to share the same qualities of a chair, even if they look different or perform different functions. Uh, they are all equal in, in substance and power. Uh, and then we talked about God's works of creation and his works of providence, his works of creation specifically, how he created us. And we talked about man being created in the Imago Dei. This is a, a pretty easy one. Uh, Mr. Rinker back there, what does Imago Dei mean? That's right, he's made in the image of God. And lots of people go back and forth. What does this mean? Does it mean that we physically look like him? Does it just mean his his attributes, uh, that's a really interesting discussion to have. But we, we talked about man being made uniquely, right? He wasn't made like the creatures, uh, out of nothing and all at once in the way that he said, let there be these creatures. And they just all came forth at once. No, God got down into the dirt and formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life. And there's our first picture of people being both earthly and spiritual. Uh, and then he makes the woman uh, from man and puts them in relationship to each other and in relationship with him. He gives them dominion over the earth and puts them in the garden and he sets up the, what we call the covenant of works. And he gives Adam the specific instruction that he may not eat of this one tree. And we talked about this, this um, challenge being in front of him every moment of every day. This was a representation of God's authority and sovereignty over Adam and that he had this challenge. And, and later on, a couple lessons later, I, we real, I really tried to emphasize for you that from the beginning, we get this idea that even though man has the will to choose whether he's going to obey or disobey, this plan for redemption, the plan that says we need a savior is in place from the very beginning. And uh, Adam cannot, uh, cannot keep the covenant of works. And that affects his will, where man had that free will, now he has a won't, as Pastor Barker has put it. He does not desire to do what God has asked of him. He also has a can't. He can't do anything to justify himself uh, before God. And we talked about uh, <clears throat> original sin, how that passes to uh, every generation that has come since Adam. And the state that man lives in where he cannot please God with anything he does and he doesn't desire to please God. What is that state called? That state where he can't and he won't. Let's see. How about Hannah? Let's pick on Hannah today. What is that state that we are living in where we have a can't and a won't? Two words. First word starts with T. We've got a backup. Let's see if Hannah can get it.
Total depravity. Thank you very much. Total depravity, where, where we are corrupted to such an extent that our will is broken and we cannot justify ourselves. And that passes through Adam to us as our covenant head. He was responsible for maintaining the covenant of works. And so man is cursed. The serpent is cursed. The woman is cursed in her relationships. And the earth is cursed through Adam. But we see immediately God's mercy and grace. God's mercy and grace. And we gave you very specific definitions for those. Somebody tell me what mercy is. Mercy. Okay, the withholding of something we do deserve and grace is. Esther, you want to pick it up? I know that's not what you raised your hand for. If mercy is the withholding of something we do deserve, grace is the... Giving of something we don't deserve. The giving of something that we don't deserve, right. So, God's, um, uh, God doesn't give immediate death, and he does give a promise of a redeemer, of a messiah, of a deliverer. And that deliverer, he says, is going to come through the seed of the woman. We talked about this a lot more uh, in the last couple of weeks, why that Messiah, why that deliverer had to come through the woman. And that's because our covenant head is the one uh, who, who broke the covenant, who couldn't keep the covenant and the curse in, in Adam all die. So he had to come, he had to be born sinless from a woman who uh, was a virgin who conceived by the Holy Spirit we spent a little bit of time last week talking about um, some confusion about Mary, specifically in the Roman Catholic Church. I tried to tell you why that confusion is understandable, but it's, it's become a, a thing that is much larger than it ever should have been. Um, we also talked about, we, we, we said why um, Mary uh, is certainly special in that God chose her for this. She was blessed because of this, um, but that she was not born sinless, and she didn't stay sinless, okay? So uh, the one who is special, the one who is promised, is her son. We call him the second Adam because he's our new covenant head. We now live under no, no longer under the covenant of works where it's up to man to keep up uh, to, to obey God perfectly, it's now God who's going to fulfill this covenant for us. The God-man, Jesus, is going to, to come and obey perfectly in our stead. So he was born sinless, and he lived that perfect life to redeem his people. And we ended last week with three terms, redemption, propitiation, and reconciliation. It should be pretty easy to find in your notes. Redemption, propitiation, and reconciliation. We talked about redeeming, uh, coming to, uh, to uh, pay that price to get us back. Propitiation, to appease God's wrath. He bore all of the wrath that God had for all of our sins, even the ones you don't remember. And that reconciliation, he removes the barrier between God and man and restores the communion that man lost with God in the fall. That's one of the, that's, that's the first thing that the catechism tells us that we lost in the fall, God's judgment. We lost communion with God. And that's what Christ comes to restore that fellowship, and that communion with us. Any questions? I know it was a long review before we move on, but is there anything that's still sticking in your mind? All right. So that all, yes? Uh, at the end of our notes from last week, I did not clearly hear the answer for the last two fill-in-the-blanks. Only Christ can be the blank in the blank. Just... He's the just and justifier. You. you are welcome. So he, he, uh, he can, he's the can, right? He can justify on our behalf. He's the judge and he justifies. You. you are welcome. 
So today we kind of, we, we come to this question, what does that have to do with me? As I said, we've painted in very broad brush strokes this story, this beautiful story of God's redemption. And sometimes we read a beautiful story that may mirror this great story in scripture and it's in a fantasy world or it, it happens to somebody else. But this is a story that has everything to do with you and with me. So today we're going to move from a, a, a large emphasis on those opening chapters of Genesis that we've had in this, uh, in this initial phase here and zoom ahead to Acts. Uh, the book of Acts chapter 2. This is the story of the church right after the Gospels conclude with Christ's resurrection and uh, ascension. So um, Acts is the story of the fulfillment of the gospel, the fulfillment of the gospel. And um, some people like to call this story the, uh, the birthday of the church. Pastor Barker likes to emphasize that, that Pentecost is not the birthday of the church because the Old Testament tells us of the men and women who had faith in the promise of the coming Messiah. And the New Testament clarifies, specifically in Hebrews, that these, the faith of these men and women was uh, counted as righteousness. And so he kind of likes to clarify that the birthday of the church is also Genesis 3.15. If you walk away from this class remembering Genesis 3.15, we will have accomplished something. Um, but you know this is a, this is an extremely important moment in the life of the church because we start to see the fulfillment or the application of those promises to individuals like us and this is the story we call it today pentecost the jews would have called it i'm going to butcher the pronunciation but this is shavuot this is the the feast of weeks okay and it was one of three pilgrimage festivals that we find commanded in the Old Testament. It commemorates the giving of the law and the revelation of the Torah to Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, as we call the Old Testament. Um, and so uh, that's one of the reasons that this story is really special and why God chooses it, because it is, it is a feast directly after uh, Christ comes and, and dies and ascends into heaven when Jews would have come from throughout the Roman Empire and the Greek-speaking world and come to Jerusalem to celebrate it together. This is kind of the first big moment after Christ ascends into heaven and gives the Great Commission when his apostles and disciples could give this message to a large group of people. This is kind of that first big holiday. So the, the uh, disciples were all gathered in Jerusalem. All of these Jews were gathered from throughout the Roman Empire, all in one place. And we read, I should have gone, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all gathered in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we see in these opening verses of Acts chapter 2 a visible outpouring of the Spirit of God. And the result of this outpouring is that they're given a gift, a supernatural gift, in preparation to, to prepare them to speak to these people who had come from throughout uh, the Roman world. They were equipped to fulfill the great commission that Jesus had given to them. And the Spirit of God is uh, poured out in an extraordinary way. Uh, not just this gift, but perhaps an extra measure of boldness to preach the good news of the gospel. And so that's what we find later in Acts chapter 2. Peter, representing all of them, he stands up and he preaches a sermon. And that sermon is word for word. We, we don't know um, what language he spoke it in. It's recorded in, in Greek for us. 
Um, but if you have, if you have your copies of, of the Bible, turn to Acts chapter 2. If not, they should be in the pews for you. But this is a great passage for us to read together before discussing it. This is, um, this is Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose. All right. These disciples are all speaking in tongues. Some people understand them, others don't, and they've been accused of being drunk. He says, but these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." So he's got all of these Jews from throughout the Roman Empire. And what does he start with? He starts off with the prophecy of Joel to tell them exactly what is happening. This was foretold by one of our prophets. And here is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. That's a rough sermon, right? God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will also dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. <coughs> Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses." Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel, all of these people, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So he's referencing the prophets. He's explaining why Jesus is the man foretold, the Lord foretold by David, their king, the king they've been waiting to return. And he ends with, this is the one you killed. Bad news. Bad news for these men and women who've traveled all this way to celebrate. What a bummer. So what is their response? What response should we have to this good news? Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy 
Spirit. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. So he ends his sermon, bad news. Their immediate response is, what shall we do? And he says, repent. Repent and be baptized, and you will receive the outpouring of the Spirit of God. And that doesn't mean that they'll be given the same gift of, of uh, other speaking other languages as the apostles have been given, but that same Spirit will re- be poured out on you when you repent. That's the full gospel. Repent, realize your need for Jesus Christ, and repent. Now, uh, something that uh, we, we just want to take a moment to clarify here, and that is that we do want to follow these instructions. We do, we do want to hear the words of Scripture and obey them. And we believe that uh, men and women who repent of their sin and turn to Christ for salvation should be baptized. This is a good thing that we do out of obedience to Christ. Uh, But we do want to be careful not to make some of the mistakes that perhaps well-intentioned people have made um, to say that baptism cleanses us from our sin. This is not the case. We do not want to be like Emperor Constantine, who heard the news of the gospel, claimed it, protected the church in many uh, excellent ways, uh, asked it to recognize heresy and forced it out. Yes, he had some political motivations, certainly, but he heard this good news and waited to be baptized because he mistook the instructions here to, to be that baptism would cleanse him from his sin. So he, rather than making that full public profession in a very humble way before his brothers and sisters in Christ, he waited until his deathbed to be baptized because he believed that that canceled out the rest of his sin. And we say no. Scripture, again, read the whole of Scripture. It's not water baptism that cleanses us from our sin. It's the work of Christ on the cross. It's his fulfillment of the covenant on our behalf that does this. And, you know, Scripture uh, emphasizes in many more uh, places uh, that repentance is really what we're looking for. Yes, we do believe that baptism is good, and it's something that we do out of obedience. After, uh, salva- after regeneration and justification, if you are an adult, but uh, there are other passages in Acts that emphasize repentance. Acts 3.19, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Repentance there is the key. Acts 8, repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Acts 11, and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to to life. So this stands in um, contrast to, you know, what are, what, are, what are the easy things you can do? There are lots of well-intentioned people who offer, sometimes we call it easy believism, you don't have to use that term, but an easy way to find God's favor, whether that is the mistake that baptism will do that for you, or, um, you know, just praying the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer is not bad in and of itself. But repentance, the scriptures are saying, is the thing that leads to life. We need to recognize just how sinful we are and turn away from that sin and trust in the perfect obedience of Christ. All right. Now, in this story, yes, please, please. Can you go back a slide? Absolutely. We, we were talking about what, what is Dave's emphasis here and, and what is the, some of the hang-up that some people have. Okay, so repent and be baptized. It sounds like it's an order. First this, then this. And so this is where some of our Baptist brethren say, hey, you guys are not being biblical here. Here's the order. And we don't think of it so much as an order, uh, and, 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 um, 
the chronological order as a hen dias. Hen meaning one, dias meaning two. It's one thing that is two. Repent and be baptized. Both. You were saying of Constantine, it's ridiculous that he repented a long time ago and wasn't baptized. That did, that doesn't make sense. So so also, if you're baptized and you never repent and don't have a childhood of repentance, you're not being true to your baptism. So also, if parents brought their children to us and said, we want you to baptize our child. Meanwhile, they were living in unrepentant sin, we'd say, no, this doesn't make sense. These two things go together. They're not necessarily, they're not necessarily be chronological, mm -hmm. but they have to go together. Okay, so for those watching online, Pastor Hathaway is clarifying that um, the order does the chronological order of repentance and baptism is not what we're looking at here, but that it is the pairing of the two of them, that they go together. Yes? It's a bullet list, not a numbered list. Okay, a bullet list, not a numbered list. All right. So we see here in this passage the third person of the Trinity highlighted uh, pretty boldly. We, we've talked about his introduction in other uh, parts of Scripture, uh, other parts of scripture has highlighted this communion of the triune Godhead before and the work of the Spirit many times in the Old Testament, but the New Testament is much more explicit about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as we said, the third person of the Trinity, there, there's your underline there. Um, it's the Holy Spirit that changes your heart from stone to flesh. It's the Holy Spirit that moves in you to cry out, what must I do to be saved? It's the Holy Spirit that causes you to respond to the good news of the gospel. And it's the Holy Spirit then that gives you encouragement as a Christian to obey the Lord day after day after day. It's the Holy Spirit that holds you up, that moves you forward, that encourages you. You And we've got a few um, uh, characteristics specifically um, about the Holy Spirit that we're going to highlight here. Um, I, I've talked to you before uh, about uh, whether or not this, this third person of the Trinity is a he, she, or it. Um, we know that this is a person. It is not a force. It's not like Star Wars. It's not like electricity. It's not your conscience. This is an actual third person of the Trinity, and he's sovereign. He's providential. Uh, Jesus speaks of the Spirit being like the wind. He goes where he will. You cannot predict. You cannot control. You cannot outmaneuver him. And that's his sovereignty and his providence and the electing power of God to move within specific individuals. He's the one who converts the soul. Uh, we have highlighted here the passage in Ezekiel, the dry bones passage that is so famous, uh, where Ezekiel, the, the prophet Ezekiel, is told to go and preach to dry bones, which seems like a ridiculous command. But the Spirit of God causes those dry bones to gather together and become alive. It's the Spirit of God that the church depends on to advance the cause of the kingdom and to see the church grow. And then we're highlighting that the Holy Spirit uh, dispenses the word of God. 2 Timothy 3 says all of the scriptures are God-breathed. We talk about the scriptures being inspired, yes, the word inspired, though, can cause a little bit of confusion because it's, we kind of use it uh, ubiquitously to talk about somebody who's very gifted or, or has mastered their craft, produced something wonderful and beautiful. But that's a little I inspired. When we talk about scripture, we talk about it being breathed out by God. It's the spirit that's poured into the heart and mind of the gospel writers like Luke or uh, poured into the, the heart and mind of Paul and Timothy. He's also a comforter. Jesus says that when I go, I will send the comforter. He may convict you of your sin, true, but he also comforts you. That's the Spirit of God. And sometimes we kind of romantically attach this comfort to 
uh, the person, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, because he endured so much on our behalf. But the scriptures are clear, and Jesus' own words are clear. He's seated at the right hand of God, just like uh, uh, Peter reminds the Jews that David foresaw. He's physically and spiritually at the right hand of God. It's the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit that comforts us, that ministers to us personally. So here are two words that might help us understand a distinction between the second and third person of the Trinity. We say that salvation or redemption is the thing that was accomplished by Christ on the cross and then as he rose again. That was his sacrifice, right? That one sacrifice for all, the perfect lamb of God slain, it's done, no more animal sacrifice, no more bloodshed required. This is the perfect sacrifice, fully satisfying the justice of God. But then that redemption is applied to us individually. You know, we're, here we are 2,000 years later. Most of us are not, you know, don't have a connection to the Jewish people by uh, physically or spiritually, or physically, that's what we're highlighting here. Um, so what, what does this have to do with us? Well, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that applies that work of redemption to each person that is saved. And uh, how does he do this? Uh, he does this in many ways. You know, the, the stories that we hear so often are usually the dramatic ones of either children or adults who have what we sort of call a conversion experience. And we call it that because it is usually preceded by some very difficult or hard experience in their life. The, the Holy Spirit allows somebody to hit a very hard wall or descend into a very deep, dark hole in their personal and spiritual lives. That's, you know, usually we hear about this when an adult is explaining their conversion story to us. And sometimes the Lord uh, allows that to happen in our lives because he knows, it's, it's, I'll, I'll use this analogy again, it is a beautiful story. The, the tragedy and heartbreak we understand, but he redeems us. He saves us. That's the good news. It's not good news without the tragedy, without the heartbreak, without the sin uh, that has affected every part of our lives. Uh, a story that we might look to to illustrate this kind of conversion experience is the story of the Philippian jailer. Hopefully you know this. Uh, this takes place later in Acts, uh, where Paul and Silas have been imprisoned, and they are in their jail cell, and what are they doing? What are Paul and Silas doing? Matthew. They're singing. What are they singing? Anybody know? They're singing God's words so loudly that they can be heard. And then uh, we read that the earth shakes and the doors are opened and the jailer thinks, I'm done. I'm done for. His own life was forfeit as a Roman jailer having let prisoners escape. And Paul cries out to him, do not, your life is not forfeit. And the jailer falls on his knees and asks, what must I do to be saved? So this is an interesting illustration of what we so often hear, even today, from men and women who are, are coming to Christ. This was a, the, the Holy Spirit is active throughout this story. There are specific people here. There are men who are able to preach the gospel to this jailer. And they are proclaiming it. They are singing God's words so loudly that he can hear them. So the people who can give the good news are there. They are giving the good news. And then the Spirit works miraculously to bring this man to a place of desperation so that he is humbled. Now, this is a very dramatic event, but he's humbled and the Holy Spirit moves in his heart to ask, 
how may I, how can I be saved? And Paul and Silas continue to instruct him and confirm him in his faith, and he repents. So that's one biblical story straight from the pages of scripture that help us better understand what this might look like in our lives. Another instance where this is illustrated uh, is in the parable, what we usually call the parable of the soil, Pastor Bar- or I'm sorry, the parable of the sower. Pastor Barker likes to um, Pastor Barker likes to do his own thing. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, and he calls this the parable of the four soils um, because the word of God that is sown is not different. That doesn't change. What is illustrated here is the four soils or the ways that people respond. So the, soy, or the sower, I don't know why, the sower, the sower goes out to sow the seed and it's not, he's not a modern farmer Uh, where he's got everything in lovely little lines and he's spreading everything uh, through machines. No, he's going out and he's casting his seed in the field. Um, And this is the word of God. The Great Commission told the disciples and the apostles, go and preach the word, okay? Tell everybody and scatter the seed abroad and uh, we'll see what happens. And the story tells us that uh, that some is going to fall on hard ground. What is this hard ground? Maybe this is a stubborn person, maybe an atheist, somebody who has heard the word uh, but refuses to believe, perhaps on philosophical grounds. This just, like, like the man I mentioned to you last week, who has heard the good news that someone came and paid for his sins by dying on the cross, and he says, That's evil. That's wicked. I want nothing to do with that. I would never ask someone to die for me. Perhaps that's what's illustrated here, the hard heart. And he's condemned by the word that he has heard. Um, uh, The second and third soils, you know, sometimes cause a little bit more consternation for us, maybe concern. Maybe we look at these soils and wonder, is this us? Uh, the soil, that the rocky soil, the difficulty in your life, the trials uh, and contentious things in your life that cause you to ask, is God truly loving? Is this good news something that I really want when I have encountered so much hardship in my life? Um, and, and that soil does not bear fruit. The third soil, the weedy soil, perhaps this is a, a man or a woman who hears the word and has a lot of distractions, a lot of things going for them um, that, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to the hardships that they say, "I, I don't want God, I don't believe that he's good. Maybe they feel like they don't need God because they already, they have so much and they're distracted by that. These are just some possible explanations for this. But um, the, the fourth soil, the word of God is sown in. This is fertile soil. This is soil that has been prepared. And we attribute that preparation to the Holy Spirit, the one who uh, prepared, who, who makes your heart soft before the word is sown in it and makes you capable of bearing good fruit. I'm going to pause there. Pastor Hathaway, anything you want to add about the four soils? All right. So our catechism uh, clarifies some of these things, um, and and I believe those are your uh, underlines there, effectual calling. The catechism asks, how are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ. So how do we partake? How do we get a piece of this? How, do we, how, how is this redemption uh, applied to us? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how, yeah, my, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, it, and it says, by the effectual application of it to us by his Holy Spirit. And how does the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ, by working faith in us, thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. Both of these questions, or answers rather, use the word effectual to make a distinction between the general 
call of the gospel and the effectual call of the gospel. So the general call of the gospel is what you hear in many places from many people. Repent and be saved. That's good. That's true. But many people will hear it and do not do it. The effectual call of the gospel is when the Holy Spirit says to you, did you hear that? Do you know what that means for you? Do you know how sinful you really are? Do you know that you need a savior? You must repent. You must get rid of the pride that has been putting you on heaven's throne. It's got to go. The effectual call of the Holy is the effectual call is the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's heart. The catechism uh, goes on then to ask, what does God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse due to us for sin? What is the, the wrath of God is due to us because we sin. We can't say, I've been a decent guy, not as bad as him. We have to come to the point, the Holy Spirit has to lead us to a point where we understand God's wrath And we have to have faith. The Lord requires us to have faith in Jesus Christ and to repent. And Pastor Barker is just highlighting here at the end another way to to look at repentance. Some theologians use uh, the the coin uh, to illustrate repentance means to turn away from sin and toward uh, something else, towards uh, obedience, that we must turn away. So what is repentance unto life then? Repentance unto life is a saving grace. We're going to highlight this word. We've already reviewed what grace is earlier on, but we need to emphasize here that all of these things, as we've been discussing the Holy Spirit, as we've just been discussing his effectual call, we need to make sure here at the end of our discussion of salvation and the Holy Spirit that this is not something that we do on our own at all. The Reformers used to say that if you can claim any part of this process, then you can claim all of it. Or on the flip side, Jesus did none of it. So we, we really need to drive home here at the end that repentance itself, the Catechism says, is a saving grace. It's a gift. This is something that you did not produce on your own. Whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it, repent, turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. So repentance itself is a gift that allows the sinner to turn away from his sin and towards new obedience. Likewise, faith is a grace. Another gift from God, something we cannot claim to have done on our own. Scripture backs this up in, in many places. A very famous one, Ephesians 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. There we go again, the reformers. If you can claim any of it, you can claim all of it. But we can't. No one can boast. <clears> Second <throat> Peter 2. Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a gift of his, not something we've done ourselves. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. The Holy Spirit gives us a saving faith, and we are moved in our hearts to exercise it. So the catechism again, faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation 
as he is freely offered to us in the gospel. This is the, the salvation is something that Christ accomplishes for us and the Holy Spirit applies it. So they're working together. Now, as we come to a close, uh, Pastor Barker wants, uh, wants us to highlight here what exactly is faith. We've said it's a gift. It's a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation. But we use faith in a lot of ways. Again, another ubiquitous term. We've borrowed a lot of terms from our scriptures that we use in everyday language. And so we want to make sure as Christians we understand what is faith. We even hear it like in some Disney movies, right? Faith, hope, and pixie dust. What, what is this? What, what is faith? And the Reformers were very clear on this, that faith is actually full of knowledge, okay? You have to know what the gospel is. Every once in a while, Barna and other folks will come out with a study. They're usually really depressing. Sometimes I think unnecessarily depressing. And they'll ask evangelicals if they know what the gospel is, like the basics of the gospel, and it's always the majority can't answer that question. You have to actually know what the gospel is in order to believe it. Okay? So please make sure, you can't just say, well, I'm a Christian, I have a lot of faith, this is very popular today. We've even started replacing these concepts with the word spiritual, right? I'm very spiritual. Um, and and they, they take that to encompass Christianity and a lot of other things that have nothing to do with Christianity. So know the gospel. That's the first step. We have to have knowledge. And Pastor Barker is using the image of a compass here to think about faith, that faith uh, is like a compass in that um, it gives us knowledge of what direction to go. Okay, it's, it's going to give us that kind of raw data, if you will, where north, south, east, and west are. So that's the thing we know. And then we have to trust it. So for a compass, if it tells me which way north is, that's the way I want to go, but uh, this thing this seems a little broken to me. Maybe it was made in China. I don't know. Whatever reason you might have, you have to do what it says. And that, you, or you have to believe that it knows what it's talking about, and then you have to obey. The third aspect of a saving faith is obedience. You have to know the gospel, you have to trust it to be the word of God, and you have to obey it. Not that obedience earns you salvation. But if you've been given the gift of faith, then you must trust it and obey it and do what Jesus tells you to do. You have to pick up your cross and follow him. That's not works righteousness. No, he's saying if you have true faith already, then you must follow me. You must do what I command. And we'll stop there. Any, uh, anything from Pastor Hathaway or any of you before we close in prayer? So if you're having a hard time understanding the personhood of the Holy Spirit, and I, ha I have a hard time with this, the Old Testament almost exclusively refers to the Spirit as ruach, which is wind. Okay, that's a power, that's a force, that's not a person. And in the New Testament, it's most often referred to as ta numa, which is a disembodied spirit. That's not a person. So is it really a person? Yes, here it's referred to with um, masculine pronouns in, I think, John 12 and 13. But then here, this has always been helpful for me. Uh, Paul says, for I know in... Um, he says, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Okay, the Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So you're saying, okay, you said he's a person, but what person? What's his characteristics? What's, who, who is he like? He's like Jesus Christ. If you've read about Jesus Christ, if you've seen his character, that's what he's like. And let me use another 
force metaphor to help you understand this person of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we talked about a compass there. I don't know if you've, have you ever played with a compass before? Okay, have you ever taken a magnet and put it around a compass? Okay, it messes with the compass. So what we're talking about here, what the Spirit does, is it's if someone, you didn't have this in you already, but it's if someone said, drink this magnet juice. Drink this magnet nectar and magnetizes you. You didn't do it to yourself. You became magnetized. Okay, what would happen if you were magnetic? Okay. Little magnetizing, magnetized things would stick to you, okay? And they just stick to you. Okay, that's like the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, but also big magnets you would be inexorably drawn to if you were magnetized. And that's what it feels like when the Spirit is working in us. We're drawn to the Lord. We're drawn to the things of God. People will stop by the boardwalk chapel, because, not because of anything that we said to them. They just said, something moved me to come here. Chris White, did you know anybody at this church before you came here? Was it because our website was so beautiful? <laughs> the Holy Spirit drew him here. And it's not just to a church, but it's to Christians in general. This is how the Holy Spirit works. It's something pulling you. Something that you didn't generate in and of yourselves. This is what we're talking about. The Spirit works in us to desire these things. And we didn't talk very much today about the gifts of the Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit. We'll talk about that more in the Christian life. But be assured, this person of the Spirit, he gives gifts. This person of the Spirit produces character traits that are holy and good and that you didn't generate in and of yourself by your willpower. Let's pray.